Hey, 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 thanks for being in the REC experience. I'm your host, Jazz Takar, with your girl, Laura Elto Stewart. What's up? Hey, Jazz, how's it going? I feel we haven't done this in a while. It's been a while since you and I have done this. We're obviously doing this virtually. Um, you're at home, I'm at home. Um, I'm, I, I have a little different background than I normally do during my yeah, morning. Yeah, nightcap background. Yes, this is my nightcap background. Thanks for bringing yeah. that up. Um, nightcap live on Instagram every single night at 9 p.m. Go to my profile, jazztacker13, number 13, jazztacker13 on Instagram. It's, uh, it's a little nightcap at the end of the night, Monday to Friday, every single night, 9 p.m. on Instagram. It's kind of cool. I go live. I- I feel like you're kind of doing this as a um, reason to have a nightcap yourself. Look, it's that's my. I guess. mean, I I probably actually been drinking more on now that I've been doing the nightcap. Um, keep in mind. To my nightcappers, you don't have to have uh, 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 an alcoholic drink. Some of my guys and gals just come and have a warm glass of milk, some hot water and lemon, so do I. A lot of tea. I know every time you <laughs> every time you come on, you generally have a couple of glasses of wine. I always ask what people are drinking. Whoa, 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 whoa! I'm not on every night. <laughs> No, no, no. But I mean, like when you come on as a, as a nightcapper, you just come in, you come in support. And so I appreciate that. Um, yeah, well, it's been a lot of fun. You've had some great guests and I'm sure you're going to continue. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes it's guests and sometimes it's a little uh, soliloquy that I'll go on, um, a little rant, so to speak, go on my soapbox. Um, so yes, please come join me there. Thank you for all the support here on the podcast. Um, everyone who's reaching out to us, Ato, like, How's how's everything during quarantine? I mean, we 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 reached out to everyone that we possibly could uh, as an REC insider, and uh, it was quite overwhelming to to hear uh, to read some of the messages that we got back. That there's so many people thinking of us. Like, you know, you forget that 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 our REC nation is growing daily. I know, so, I know, I know. I'm so grateful for it. How can we help you? Then they started saying to us, "No, no, no. How can we help you?" And um, it was really. It was really, make, gave me the warm and fuzzies because, you know, you help these people buy real estate and in situations like this, you, you don't know if the connection translates uh, beyond that, but it really does. We really are a, a family here. Everyone's willing to do whatever they can and need to do to help each other. So that's just been wonderful. Talking about family, how are you, Abby and Rudy doing? How's, how are you guys all holding up in quarantine? Well, I think Rudy's having the time of his life every day he knows he's on his new routine and he got to his new routine really quickly he knows exactly when he gets his treats he gets more treats than he usually did he gets more (laughs) walks than he usually did and he knows the exact time that he's gonna go on those walks um so we're pretty much sticking to Rudy's schedule well that's the way it goes I'm sure that's the same way with kids (laughs) tell me (laughs) yeah yeah I got the two I got the two little boys I mean obviously they uh they make some guest appearances and 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 in the first week it was quite natural for one of them, especially my younger one, the four-year-old. He thought it was just cool to make guest appearances naked. And so that was his thing. And he would come in and and then he started to realize that daddy is actually working. Uh, okay, so they've been yeah. really good. It's it's been really cool to to um to see them grow, you know, I'm uh, I'm getting an opportunity. Um, uh, I try to have a coffee with them in the morning as they ha- as they have breakfast. That's kind of daddy time. Um, here and there, I get some lunch with them, and then uh, evenings are good because I, I I generally, not that not that a lot of people know, but I can cook. Not on the stove or in the kitchen. I'm a griller, so I do some barbecuing, and the weather's you starting to turn out. Really- yeah. So you can cook a burger. Who can't cook a burger? <laughs> <laughs> hey, I could do hot dogs. I could do sausages. Oh. I could. I did lamb chops tonight, so it was pretty good. I'm actually really, really excited about it. Um, what I'm actually more excited about is 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 this episode. Myself and Simos. Yes, tell us were, about this were, episode. Yeah, so it was myself and Simos um, having a coffee with Michael Ciracini, president and CEO of um, Keyspire. You guys have heard uh, a lot of you listeners are members of Keyspire. It's the the biggest investment group in the country. I've known Michael for six years. You've got to know him now for the last three, four years, I think, right, Laura? Oh, yeah, yeah. And he's a fascinating guy. I mean, there's never a dull moment, certainly not <laughs> in his head. He, he has so more true. ideas than he knows what to do with. It's, it's yeah, crazy. Yeah, we, like, I've been lunch with him. Was it, about a year? I was going to say about maybe six, seven, eight months ago. I can't remember. Time has 
it's slow down during Ooh, COVID well, and then it's like cares? speeding up. <laughs> yeah, who cares kind of thing in terms of how long it's been. But the last time we got to see him um, physically, we, had, we were in his office and is he ever the mad scientist there? Like this guy just comes up with 67 ideas in 60 seconds kind of thing. Um, but uh, okay, between the nice two enough. of you, it was like, we had to like pull you each apart from each other. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah definitely. On. I really look up to the guy. I mean, uh, uh, he's, he's, I've seen him grow this company um, to, to a place where like, you know, I, I was saying actually to, I was saying to Michael on this episode that, that he's probably the one guy that I know who can grow a community faster than anyone else. Like it's just so, Fast the way. In fact, there was about over seven, eight hundred people listening live to this to this episode, um, like live on on Facebook Live to be exact. There's a great Facebook group. It's free to join. It's called Real Estate Millionaires by Keyspire. Anybody who's listening or watching, just go on Facebook, search Real Estate Millionaires by Keyspire, and and just request uh, to be part of it. And one of their admin team will get you on. Uh, but this was nice. He invited us over to his home again, virtually. And we virtually, had a coffee yeah. with him virtually. Uh, we had a coffee with him and like this guy's, this guy, I don't even know how many doors and how hundred, like hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars of worth, worth of, uh, uh, of real estate. He owns, um, so many, so many, uh, tenants he's dealt with investors. He's, he's one of our go-to guys when we just want to get some data. And definitely when it comes to how do you, how, like, how do you build out a portfolio? Because he's done so, it. Yeah, himself. you don't certainly have to grow it out to that size, but he did start young and he was obviously quite aggressive about it and creative. What I'm always amazed with was when people said no to him, like mortgage brokers, he told us all the time, they said no. And he was like, okay, I guess most people would just say, I guess I can't do it. Where he was like, that's not an answer I'm comfortable with. I'm going to go and reach out to more people. I'm going to figure out a way. And so his creativity, I think, is really what's helped him build what it is today. Shout out to the whole team at Keyspire, Michael, Scott McGilvery, um, uh, Amanda, Richard, uh, Valerie, and I know I'm missing so many people, Jordan, um, Joanna. Big, big shout out to the whole team. <laughs> Joanna, yes, 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 for sure. Um, just, uh, I apologize for the some of the names I might have missed, but uh, just a fantastic team, fantastic group of people, so like so humble, always willing to help. Um, and this, this, this was kind of, it was two parts. We just kind of mashed it together. Um, where, where. Um, Michael was asking myself and Stimos kind of what's going on in the greater Toronto market, what's some strategies that can work well. Um, so we dove into that, but then we were flipping it kind of back and forth, back over to him. Like what's his strategies during COVID, you know, coming from a guy again, who owns so much real estate um, and has such an investor mindset. Like what's, what's his thought process. And he's dropped some, he dropped some really, really like, golden nuggets in terms of his mindset and how he would approach it if he was a new investor or even somebody who owns eight to 12, 15 doors, what his so, thought process is. I think what you're telling our listeners and watchers to do is get a notepad out, take a couple notes down because there's going to be a lot of fire content. Also, thank you so much for everything that you've been up to uh, during this quarantine. Of I mean, course. we all as as REC, we have a, a couple of virtual offices set up, so I get to see you on a regular basis, virtually, um, and 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 still just the work. Fortunately that you or unfortunately. <laughs> Yeah, a little bit of both, actually. It depends what time of day you ask me that question. Um, <laughs> but for now, again, thank you. Um, and You're to our work. And to our listeners and our viewers, as always, if you haven't had an opportunity to follow us on, on one of the podcast platforms that you're listening on, please do so. And if uh, you haven't uh, subscribed to our YouTube page, please, again, do so. Press that button, subscribe button, drop the bell. You'll see a little notification bell. This way you always know about new content that is coming up. And as always, just shoot us some feedback. Let us know what you think of the content and make sure that uh, uh, you do leave a comment. Leave a comment because we always know that that always tells us if we're doing well or not. Make sure you guys take care of yourself. As always, again, if you need anything, just reach out to us. Enjoy the show. REC Experience presents Real Estate Entrepreneurship Leadership with your host, Jazz Takar. The REC Experience Podcast is now on air. Today, we're going to talk about how you can survive, not only survive, but thrive as a real estate investor during this COVID pandemic. Um, 
we're going to talk about how some investors are kicking ass out there while the rest of us are kind of just pausing and, and waiting to see what happens. And so I'm one of the guys pausing to wait and see what happens. Um, there's not a lot of urgency in my life right now to go make more money in real estate. So I'm in a position where I'm like, you know what, I'm just going to chill out. But if I was growing my business right now, if this was you know, 15, 20 years ago and I was just ready to explode, I want to make the business grow, uh, I would probably be investing right now. I'd probably be finding those opportunities. And so I want to talk today about how some people are finding the opportunities. Uh, we have two experts, national experts on here that, that um, understand all of the micro nuances, but then the macro view. So we'll talk about those. I want to talk about pre-construction and uh, the questions people are asking us at Keyspire is what's happening with pre-construction. Is that still going, are they still going to be sold or how's that going to all work? Um, and I want to talk about some headlines that we see of value versus volume. So when you see that, oh, housing is uh, down 20%, uh, and you read the article, it's just, it's it's not the value of the properties, it's either the volume or some other metric that makes a great headline. So we'll talk about all that stuff today. Of course, we're going to take your questions. It is a 60 minute special. I said, uh, I, I, I texted Jazz and, and Simeon last night. I said, guys, there's no way we're doing this in 30 minutes. Um, we got to do a 60 minute special. I said, absolutely. I said, why don't we do a joint episode of the RE Experience podcast, REC Experience podcast. So they have the REC Experience podcast, which you guys got to check out. I know a lot of you are already on there. Um, and Coffee with Michael. So the REC Experience, Coffee with Michael. We're kind of doing a joint episode today. We're going to have a lot of fun. So without further ado, I want to bring my friends on uh, right now, uh, Jazz and Simeon. I'm going to turn your videos on, guys. Uh, and here we go. Uh, welcome to Coffee with Michael. Good morning, guys. Thanks for having us, Michael. Really Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Really nice. appreciate it. I look forward to the Bob Marley music every single every single morning, my man. We, my family and I just got back from Jamaica just before uh, uh, kind of all the noise around COVID. Um, and uh, it was Bob Marley every single day there. And now it's Bob Marley every single day with <laughs> coffee with you. So thank you for doing yeah. this, my man. Yeah, it feels good. I mean, I love that song in particular, Three Little Birds, in case anyone wants to know. It's just such a feel good song. And I just, you know, just chilling out and uh, listening to it. Um, all right, guys. Well, thanks for coming on. You guys did brunch with REC on Saturday. Uh, I tuned in and it was awesome. It was a lot of fun. I kind of tuned in while I was uh, hanging out with the family. I'm going to show you uh, my picture here with my little guy. We were watching you guys. Here's the, uh, the picture of us with you guys in the background. There we go. We're oh, going wow. for a swim. Awesome. And, <laughs> right? Awesome. There it is. We're watching. Hey, We're swimming. Hey, hey, everybody has a different version of uh, the brunch. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's of the what? <laughs> the brunch. Some people were eating croissants. Some people were swimming. Hey, what's the what, <laughs> one? You know what? We're working, we're working these days on net time, right? I saw uh, your Facebook post, Jazz, and on the episode. Net time, guys, is no extra time. There's no extra time in life. So you got to sometimes do two things at once. You listen to a podcast with one ear while you're doing, while you're doing the dishes or folding laundry or working out. And so um, I was hanging out with the kids and we're playing and swimming and I'm watching you guys at the same time. Just how the timing worked out. Love it. Like we have to find hacks, right? Um, we talk about it all the time where... In Toronto, and specifically the greater Toronto area, we it takes, like myself and Seamus, we're coming in from the West End, our head office is in the East End, takes us an hour and 10 minutes to get in on a good day, an hour and 10 minutes to get back. Um, we, could, we could listen to music um, or news, and we all know if you drown yourself with so much negative news, your, your thoughts, you start to think a little bit more negative, like attracts okay. like but you can spend a lot more time educating yourself. And, and, and what better time than now? There's a lot of free online resources. There's courses you can take advantage of. Um, um, it's just a matter of finding those opportunities or more importantly, getting in the way of the opportunities because we all know there's opportunities everywhere. And, yeah. and, we're, definitely, and we're definitely seeing a big increase uh, of opportunities slowly identifying themselves. One of yeah. our kids always makes a guest appearance uh, on these videos. We're lucky that uh, my four-year-old's not running around naked behind me. So uh, <laughs> you really appreciate everyone understanding. But one of our kids always makes an appearance. I, I didn't even see her coming. She actually crept. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Hey, it's a new norm. 
I don't think I've been on a meeting or a Zoom call or any anything without uh, seeing everybody's kids. And it's just it's kind of really cool culture that we've been forced on where families are now involved in what we do. You guys are probably going to see my kids running around at some point in the back there. Well, they're being uh, homeschooled literally right there. So <laughs> the, Google, the Google Classroom is open and they're working. So it's, uh, it's interesting. And, and Mike, Michael, really quickly, man, kudos to you, buddy. Kudos to you for, for, for not only putting um, – this community together way like pre COVID, but then taking um, the time. And I know how much time this takes to produce content and then come up with content. Um, do it every single morning, do it consistently every single morning since you said you were going to do it. Um, and, 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 and I really wanted to kind of ask you like, aside from, aside from uh, uh, trying on your, 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 your jeans and making sure you get out of the Lululemon pants. I think that tip was awesome um, because those, those pants are very stretchy. What, what, what resources are you taking advantage of? Like, what are you listening to? What are you reading right now, my man? Yeah, it's a great question. So I am, uh, I'm watching um, some of the CBC updates. I am watching, um, well, I'm, I'm learning, I'm getting back to my science roots actually, cause I'm a science geek at heart. Like I, I, Went through university in biomedical science. I wanted to go be a doctor. That was my my original like life goal. Um, and then I found real estate and I did the projections of how much money I would make being a doctor. When you're 19, 20, it's about money, right? So that's that's I wanted to help people, but really I wanted to make a lot of money. The cars, the women, the house in Italy, whatever it is. So um I did the numbers on like 10 years out what I would have if I was going to be a doctor and what I'd have if I was going to be a real estate investor. This is after I bought my first property. I said, holy shit, this is how it works. And like after 10 years, <laughs> after 10 years, I layered on all the debt that I would have and the the taxes I would pay and all those things. And then I looked, I did the four ways to with real estate and I looked at how much my real estate would accumulate. And I said, man, I'm going to, be a real estate investor instead of a doctor. Now try to tell that to your parents when you come home <laughs> in the second year and you're like, ah, you know what? You know, it's like every, every parent's dream, like be a doctor or lawyer. Right. Right. <laughs> I come home. I'm like, guys, I just, I figured it out today. I figured out life. I am going to be a real estate investor <laughs> and their jaws hit the floor and they're like, what the hell are you talking about? You, we were on such a good path. Everything was great. <laughs> Michael, what are, what are you doing, Michael? Right? Yeah, what are you doing, right? My grandparents, like, oh, uh, actually, my grandparents were the most supportive. I think they're in their eighties. Italian um, came over here, and real estate's the only thing that really saved their life because they came here with no money. Like standard immigrant story, came here with no money. My grandfather um, bought a house downtown Toronto for I don't even know how much, like eight thousand, five thousand, whatever it would be. Yeah, yeah. Uh, two million dollar house now. That's irrelevant, but everyone lived in his house. My dad told me everyone came from Italy, lived in his house until they found a job. So he was the hub and it was very common with the culture and, and migration of that time. Um, but they realized that real estate is what their entire wealth. He worked every single day in a factory and couldn't even touch what just that one house made in only appreciation, not even the four ways to win of renting it. So they were super supportive, which was really cool, which I guess trickled down. And um, that's a long way of answering the question and saying that I love the science videos. I love learning about like, I love learning about how I took epidemiology. So I understand the wow. science of epidemiology as well. I had to within those it was years ago, but I love learning how the science works. I love learning about the, the, the virus and how it's working. So I'm, that's how I'm I, I, focusing my energy when it comes to the news, as opposed to the negative energy, I'm really educating myself. I believe education builds confidence and confidence builds success. So, wow. um, I'm learning about the science. I really think it's really cool. I'm doing that. And I'm taking two courses right now. I'm taking a um, uh, online community mastery course so I can service our online communities better. And I'm going to put my team through the course. So anyone who's in any of our, any of our online communities, real estate millionaires or income property labs or Keith Byron Circle, you're going to see some major engagement improvements coming up. Um, I think we're doing a great job, but we just want to get better. Um, and a nutrition course. That's the other thing I'm doing. I want to, you know, uh, I, I, would the body. To, I would love to hear more about that. I would love to yeah, hear the body. Hmm. Yeah. So I want to stay healthy, not only because I want my body to be healthy in, ter in terms of defense of pathogens and invasive viruses, um, but I just want to kind of live longer and be with my kids and all that stuff. So I'm really, yeah, like uh, 
I, yeah, I see people I, writing, yeah, John, BSC in the house. Uh, changed my mind for medicine after completing my undergrad. Nice. Another BSC in the like, house. I mean, for, for, for the hundreds of people that are listening to this and the thousands that are going to listen to the recording, I think, I think you know, what you can take out of what Michael was mentioning and, and, and Seamus, you mentioned this as well on our brunch this past Saturday is that we can have the mindset that, uh, of contraction or we can have the mindset of expansion. And either way, and Henry Ford said this a long time ago, um, if you think you can or if you think you can't, you're right. And so if you, if you start to think about this time of, of okay, um, I, I need to contract or everyone around me is thinking of, 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 not, uh, like of contraction, you're right. That's what you're going to attract. But if you yeah. think of, and we know hundreds, if not thousands of people right now, today, that have the mindset of expanding, the, the thoughts they ask, the questions they ask themselves, that computer, that brain starts to look for those opportunities, right? Yes, I couldn't agree more. Uh, and, and I also wanted to just loop back to uh, when Michael went off on a tangent uh, about his parents like, giving feedback on, uh, on leaving university and pursuing a real estate investment path. Um, the grandparents who were the most supportive uh, because it was real estate that saved them. Remember that comment? What I wanted to do is, and I'm actually shooting a, a, a podcast tonight with Mark LaFleur. I don't have a lot of this with Mark. Uh, he's a broker. Uh, he's an investor. Just an all-around great guy. Uh, and we're going to be talking about what strategy, like specifically, is each person using and following his mantra. Uh, and I'm going to, because it flows so well, it, and it's such a great example of real estate saving someone's life. And they never rented out, Michael said. I never did anything other than living. Real estate as a reminder to everyone. Real estate over time only does one thing. It only does one thing. It provides you with everything you need to meet your standard of life, such as the roof over your head. It creates memories. It creates all these beautiful emotions, but it creates wealth. And that's the number one thing. It always goes up. And I don't want to be silly to be held well. It doesn't always go up and in Detroit during the, the car crisis or whatever the case may be. I'm not talking about a specific one, one off type environment. I'm talking the buy and hold strategy is the number one strategy for wealth creation worldwide, any country, any economy, any type of government, other than obviously a communist government owned assets. There is not a single country on the planet where people did not create their wealth using real estate as a vehicle. Fast forward to a market like Toronto's or like Southern Ontario or like Canada period, other than the Western commodity driven uh, provinces, the real estate market in Canada was on its trajectory to be the hottest year on record. Enter our little COVID example. People who are logged on to this webinar, people who who reach out to us on a daily basis, and hundreds of people reach out to Michael, hundreds of people reach out to us daily. Our, our, our DMs on social, our emails, our, our website is constantly, people are asking the question, what do I deploy right now? And the first question is where Jazz and Michael were going earlier, is are you on the defense, are you on the offense, or are you sitting pretty, like Michael, for example, where you're just watching to see what happens and we'll make a decision based on what you see in the marketplace. That's the first question you need to ask yourself. Yeah, I think that that's important. So when I think about our audience, um, you can think about, are you in the position where you want to just kind of wait it out and just hang out a little bit? Um, you know, like I do. And this, I had Scott on last week. He's like, I'm in the same boat. We're just kind of hanging out with the family and developing our skills. Um, or are you like, hell with it. I'm going to just, I'm going to grow my business. And I want to talk to you guys a little bit about that group and, and help that group here, because the other group is very simple. Just, you know, don't buy any property, build your relationships with your community, with your tenants, um, renovate the properties if it's safe to do so, or pay your tenants to renovate the property, like just maintain and improve your business. But I want to speak to the people that are like, I want to continue to buy. And so let's, let's see if we can get into that. So a couple of things I want to talk about guys is uh, value versus volume right? From, especially from the, the headlines perspective. Uh, and we touched, you guys touched a little bit on this on Saturday as well. Uh, 
So I'd love to know a little bit about like when I see a headline. So, you know, let me, I have, I have one here. I want to share with you guys that, uh, so value versus volume. Let me just give you all my thoughts and then we'll pop into them. Mm -hmm. Um, I would love to know, uh, you know, in, in the markets, sales price, listing volume, psychology of what makes a real estate an essential service. So, you know, why are, why are real estate, um, investors so essential to the market? And then really importantly, how do I identify opportunities that during this pandemic in a COVID-19 market? Like what is somebody going to, what are they going to look for in a property? Are they going to buy a property? Is it going to be, are they going to be able to put in better offers? How would they do that? Um, what is the motivation of the parties? You know, Simeon, you said something on Saturday that many of my guests have said over the last week, which is if you don't have to sell, don't sell right now. And if somebody's selling, they're a motivated seller. So I think that's a really key piece of information for somebody watching that is ready to make a move that wants to grow their business. So I'd love to talk about that a little bit. Um, And then a little bit into pre-construction because I, you guys understand it better than anyone, you know, leaps and bounds over how I understand how it works. So uh, we can, we can get into that. So why don't we start with this, these metrics piece? I would love to start with the metrics. You guys can give us an an idea. All right. Can you see this one? I've seen this article. This is a good one. So Toronto home sales dropped 76% amid COVID-19 shutdown. So people get scared shitless when they see this stuff, but they don't go down to read the context. So what does stuff like this mean? You know, they go on to talk about it's actually just a volume versus the actual value didn't drop. But talk about like these headlines, how they're so, what they really mean. Well, first and foremost, anytime that... um, Oh, wait, sorry, Jazz, I got to stop sharing here. No worries. I was going to say, first and foremost, right. we, I think we all need to understand that it, th- the media is in the business of making you click and, 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 and read the articles. So we all use the saying around our office and understand that if it, if it bleeds, it leads. Because if the, the article said that it's going to be a very sunny day tomorrow, um, the chances of anyone really clicking on that, we just kind of bypass that. It goes in through one year, comes out the other. But if it said it's a like a crazy storm coming, um, we would all click on that. We would all want to know more. Um, so negative news always is great click clickbait. The important part in that headline, specific headline, is that it said, I think of the number they use of 76% of sales drop. Yeah. There, that means the amount of transactions drop. Which, which we kind of all forecasted to happen. It makes sense. Buyers are not leaving their homes um, as they shouldn't. Um, and sellers don't want people in their homes like they did before, like in pre-COVID. And so the amount of sales, the, 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 the amount of transactions has dropped and understandably so. But that doesn't mean that your value of your home or your condo dropped by 76%. In fact, if you look at actual values right now, it's, it, th- there hasn't been really much change in the actual overall value because it's still too early to tell, right? If we were looking at stats before um, uh, March, like at the end, like for February, February stats, we were seeing market appreciation in the GTA in and around, like you're looking at about 13 to 15% in the mid dib- uh, double digits, right? And so has like now we're seeing less amount of sales, but values haven't dropped yet because it's too early to tell. There hasn't been many stats that have come out um, because again, the people that are on the market, they need to sell and buyers that are looking for homes, they also need to buy because you made another point there, Michael, in regards to um, uh, uh, like, why is it an essential service? Like why is real estate an essential service? The reason the essential service, why there's a, uh, why real estate is an essential service is because people need homes. There, there's buyers who have sold their homes pre COVID and sellers that sold their home. And so we need to be able to provide homes at this time. Yeah. So, so to, to that guys, the, the main reason, uh, and it's not just because it's, it's too, too early to tell it's, that's obviously a huge component because people are not going to make rash decisions over two weeks of history uh, when they're selling their biggest assets of their lives. But the, the vast majority is you're not allowed to do half the activities it takes to sell a home. Um, so when sales volume goes down 76%, listings also went down 76%. So the value correlation between what's on the market available for people who are looking to buy and people to sell is still actually a huge seller's market 
Um, I, I know there's a couple of uh, comments in the chat already because they can get my pop-ups. Uh, a realtor from Guelph who's, uh, who's watching said, but all the homes in the last two weeks have been gone and asking or over asking. And that's not a coincidence. Uh, I mean, my team um, continues, like uh, we're obviously not selling uh, 50 homes a week or like a, a typical week. Uh, but I mean, the team is still uh, pounding the ground and uh, we have clients that we need to service through this pandemic uh, that were caught either sold before need to buy or bought before they sold and need to sell during this time. So we're servicing the essential uh, client list. And uh, the result is at a, at ask you or higher. And it is because as the sales volume dropped due to people not being able to do their normal activities, so did listings, so did inspections, so did banking officers. The time it takes to get a mortgage is not three days like it was before. It's, uh, it's a week and a half to get it reviewed and underwritten by the time it, it all clicks. So there's a lot to it. There's a lot to, to navigate this market. But uh, as my as my partner mentioned, there is absolutely nothing that can be uh, reliably counted on as advice on a four week test. Like we're it's April fourteenth. This all started March fourteenth. In essence, where the the lockdown and the measures took in. Uh, if anybody here wants to make true comments on the market based on the months of data, you're not speaking to me at that. Like we need. Data. Like without data, you cannot make decisions. At this point, the, the safest and best thing to do is chill. Um, but opportunities are identifying themselves. So the people who need to sell and they're right off the beaten path, they're going to take a hit. Uh, and you, as a buyer, are going to take that opportunity. Yeah. And I want to talk about you guys can give us some advice on how to find those people that are have to sell or looking to sell so we can help them by buying their property, maybe getting a uh, some sort of discount and getting them out of a worse situation. So first of all, if you're afraid of home prices going down, real estate values going down as a real estate investor, then don't be a real estate investor because they will go down. It's the, it's, they go up and down. It's how it works. It will continue to go up and down. If you're afraid of values going down or articles like this, then it's like being a goalie and having, uh, being afraid of the balls getting kicked at you. It, it's going to happen. Right? Your job is to wear the proper gloves. Your job is to have the proper form as the goalie. Your job is to have the right team around you. So the defensive team is with you. It's the same thing with real estate. Values will go up and they will go down forever. They always have, they go up and down all the way up. So I'm, I've never been afraid of values going down. I am aware of them. So I use them as part of the strategy, right? Jazz, we want to use them as part of our strategy, but we're not going to, going to, you know, cry about it or run from real estate and, what we see in real estate is an elasticity. So I'll put on my, my macroeconomic hat for a second. Uh, we see an elasticity in prices. So when the financial markets move, then the panic comes in. That moves like overnight, like instantly, right? A million transactions a second. Real estate takes a lot longer to make a transaction. So the elasticity is greater. It takes maybe two or three months for real estate to catch up if things move up or things move down. So first thing that happens is the financial markets, something happens with those. You look at any crisis in history, this is always the pattern. And then when it comes to real estate, the first thing that starts to happen is the uh, volume, right? The, the, like what we're seeing here is the number of transactions start to, to back off. Not the pricing, but the number of transactions. And then sometimes... Not always, but sometimes then the pricing might plateau. It might even soften. It might go down a little bit before it comes back up, but it's all temporary because it goes up and down forever. And if I was a real estate investor and the prices were going to soften, this would be a fantastic opportunity for me to gear up my business. It's perfectly said because if you look at a graph as they go up and down upwards prices, when they're up is when you start to think about refinancing it. Um, but if, like if you were going to use the strategy of doing a flip, that's when you might want to sell it. So when prices are higher than, that, than they've been and that, uh, on that trajectory, that's when you think of either selling it or refinancing it. When it goes down, that's when you start to think about buying. Right. And so yeah. we all know that uh, uh, situations like this, when we're in recessions um, or, or when everyone else is 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 fearful, that's when you should be greedy. I mean, arguably speaking, um, uh, Warren Buffett, uh, one of the best investors of our time, has it, we all use that that mindset of, of when people are fearful, be very greedy. When people are greedy, 
be very fearful. It's, right. it's Michael's saying it a different way. I'm saying it just a different way, but we're all saying the same thing, which is guys, it's going to go up and down upwards. You got to have the mindset. And I love your goalie analogy, my man, because if you are afraid of, of this going up and down, it is identical to you, you getting hit with the puck as a goalie. You cannot get away from that. It's going to happen. That's the game that you're in. Yeah, if you're a goalie in hockey or soccer or whatever, if you're afraid of the puck or the ball, then you don't, will fail every time. You've got to don't embrace Don't be a goalie. Don't be a goalie, right? Don't be a real estate investor if you're scared. I totally agree with you. Yeah. So, 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 so gentlemen, I think this is the time. I, I think this is a good time to remember the fundamental. Um, and, and I heard it. Uh, we were doing the mastery meetups um, across the country earlier this year. And uh, I had run into Scott. Uh, Michael, Michael's partner, Scott McGilvery, at the, he, we, we were going after the, the show where he puts the, the big one to the thousand people. Yeah. And, and we were having a chat and we were giving oh, the some, income property formula. Yeah. The, the, right. the, the event that Scott does. Yeah. So and we were just having a conversation after and it was just a, a branch off a conversation. And he said the number one thing that people fail to understand or need to put as in program as their main MO is time in the market versus yeah. trying to time the market. And uh, like we, me and you can say that, yes, this is a, of course a truth, but like when those words sink in, trying to time the market versus time in the market, time in the market will win guaranteed every time across anywhere, anytime, any time period, trying to time the market you're going to have the few that get lucky. You're going to have the few geniuses that know how to analyze data better than the other guy. But the majority that tried to time the market, just like stocks, are going to lose. Those are the gamblers. Now, yeah. Mike, so, Michael, you, you, you have like, you know, you, you've invested hundreds and hundreds of, of times into doors. Um, overall, would you say the buy and hold strategy is what's kind of earned you the, the, like the, the biggest returns? Absolutely. That's, I just love to buy and hold. Uh, you know, my favorite, my favorite example is uh, throughout the years, people always ask me, uh, Michael, I need your advice. He said, okay, when do I cash out of real estate? I've got some rental properties. When do I cash out? And I said, cash out, what do you mean cash out? Well, when do I take all my properties and sell them and then, you know, live high on the hill and go on my vacations? And I said, when you cash out, you're going to be broke because you're going to have a lump of cash and no fucking income. Yes. Income properties give you income. How do you pay for your groceries? You pay for your groceries with the equity on your statement or do you pay for your groceries with the money that comes in every month? How do you pay for your trip? How do you pay for your, you know, anything that you want in life? I said, the moment you cash out, what's going to happen? So you got a million dollars of, of uh, value, okay? You're going to sell your income properties. You're going to cash out. You're going to take that million dollars. You pay tax on it. So your million turns into, I don't know, say 600,000. So you pay 40, yep. 30% tax, 300, uh, 700,000. 700,000. Yep. Now you've got all this money. You're going to spend two or 300 grand on stupid shit. And then Always. now you have 200,000, 300,000 bucks. What are you going to do with it? You got to invest it. Where are you going to invest it? You're going to invest in the only place you know, which is real estate. So you just took a million dollars whittled it down to 300,000 with your cash out strategy. And now you're going to take the 300,000 and buy back those same damn properties for 20% more. And when I explain it to people like that, hopefully that's insightful for you guys watching that like wants to think of the end game of what is the end game, um, you know, cashing out someday versus living for today. The end game to me is having as much monthly income as I can, whether that's one property or 10 or a thousand. I don't care about number of doors or properties. I need a monthly income that supports my family, that pays for mm -hmm. the stuff I want and builds the retirement plan for myself and my kids. Income, that's it. The number of income. Um, and then I build in my principal, four ways to win, the principal pay down. I build in the appreciation that I'm going to get on the properties. And that's all part of the big plan. So uh, that's a long way of answering Buy and hold is the only thing I know. Like you guys can see this on the back end, right? I draw on my glass, which is fun ah. when people are down there looking up. But um, <laughs> this is the buy and hold graph. It goes up and down, up and down. And it, it's always higher over here than it is over here, given what Simeon said is, is the time. 
right? So it, it goes up. I do want to address the time piece though. I, I noticed somebody here mentioned that. And by the way, everyone watching, can you please uh, put your questions in the Q and A that way we can organize them. We'll get to your questions in just a moment. We're just having too much fun uh, chatting here. We get a little too passionate. Just put your questions in the Q and A and we're going to get to those, those very soon. But somebody wrote, you know, um, there is, um, where is it? Uh, it? Feel that you have to take into consideration your age when talking about investing strategy. So someone's older, near retirement, may not have enough time or tolerance to wait for an upswing. This was, uh, I can't pronounce your name, I-J-E-N, um, said here at 1133. You guys can I-Gen. check. I-Gen. I-Gen. What's up, yes. my lady? You guys know I-Gen? I-Gen? Yes, we do. Sure. Of course you do. Of course you I-Gen's know I-Gen. a, Yes, yes. <laughs> Hi, Jen. Hello. Thank you. Yeah. So that's a comment I want to comment on because, you, you know, you're right. What if I'm older and you, all right, Jazz, Simeon, Michael, you guys are young. You're in your early 20s. No problem. You guys can you guys can uh, wait for the market. Thanks for that not. compliment. Thanks for that compliment. Michael. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> what if I'm what if I'm older? Well, if you're older and you got to wait for time and you're going to invest your money somewhere else other than real estate, you're you're even more effed because, you, what are you going to put in the stock market where you're going to get a 3% return? It'll take you a hundred years to get any sort of significant amount of money. And you get the volatility, you get the low return with the high volatility. Whereas in real estate, what, what do re- rental properties do that we look at guys like 25, 30% across the four ways to win, right? Nothing less than 25. Yeah. Nothing less than 25. You're not going to get that in your, in your, in anywhere else you choose to put your, your money, you're not going to get 20, 5%. So if you don't have time, there's even more reason to go in real estate because 25% a year uh, in real estate is like 5% in the financial market over five years. So yeah. you've basically compressed five years into one by going into real estate versus the financial market. So um, time is a very important factor. And that's even more reason why I really, really like real estate. <laughs> I think a lot of people, I think a lot of people um, think that you know, being 64, 65 is old now. So like, I don't know anyone's age specifically, but thinking that if you're 65, I'm too old to invest into real estate. Guys, I mean, maybe back in the 1950s, that, that, that it was a different time um, with modern medicine, medicine, what we know about the body, what we know about the mind now, and I'm speaking to a science nerd as well uh, uh, on this video, that 65, you got another 30 years minimum left, you know, like the average person still has another 30, 25, 30 years left. Imagine what you can still get done, the portfolio that you can still build very passively. Now, if you're uh, uh, 65 and you, 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 and you'd want something more passive, then don't look at doing a flip. That might not be something that we, we would advise you to do because you might not want to be swinging hammers. That's not going to be uh, something that you're comfortable with. Start to look at more of a passive strategy. It could be, um, if it's not an income property, we obviously believe in, uh, we're obviously a little bit more biased towards in- income properties because the returns are so much higher, but you could do passive mortgage investments, land developments. They still have returns. Mortgage events, uh, investments are going to give you yearly returns. Uh, land developments are going to give you four or five year returns returns, income properties, you're still going to be able to refinance it, flip it to yourself. What we see most investors within like three years. You're st- so you still have a lot more time than you think you do. Yeah. Yeah. And Mike Seal says 65 is a new 40, right? Absolutely. Exactly. I think that's a good point. And Jazz, it's funny. I read an article the other day. Well, this isn't funny. It's interesting. I read an article the other day that most people are um, outliving their money because they're going with like, oh, I'm not going to last past 80 or 70 or like medical technology, all these things, the health and nutrition that people are into that hopefully you guys are into. You need money to last into your 90s and hundreds, which it becomes, you know, more likely as the trend. So you have more Steven time. Lytle, Stephen Lytle, a uh, uh, good friend of REC, uh, hey, a long time, long time key spy member, um, just mentioned that the average age for Canadians is 82.5. So uh, I wasn't too far off, but thanks for that, Stephen. Yeah. Yeah. So Stephen has a question. I'm going to hop to questions. Go ahead. Go ahead. I just want to enforce Jazz's point. Um, When we're talking about other investment types, be it development, being mortgage, being lease to own, there's a million different strategies that are very profitable and great. What he's saying, to be very clear, is the income property that we like more is the fact that it doesn't have a, a prefixed exit strategy. 
the win is the, the not exiting. Yeah. So, so every development, every mortgage has a term. You're going to make this much money over this term, but you're not exposed to the market. So basically, it's a very safe, stable, and passive way to invest, but you don't have the upside because you do have a deadline. So either one, two, three, five years in the future, it's going to be over. You're going to take your money and walk away happy because that's what you always wanted to do from the start. The income property in five years could be up 20000 could be up 50000 could be up 100000 could be down 10000 depending on the timing. But you don't have that chance of the upside where you can now, if it does make a big spread, you can refine it and double like make the, the return twice. So that's kind of, I just wanted to kind of just drive that home a little. Quickly to just add to that, like a real life example, I, I think back to an investor summit, April, 2016, um, uh, uh, the Keyspire team all came over to Toronto at that time. We were at the Sheridan, I believe this was, 2016. Right downtown. We, right downtown Toronto, um, like, you know, four or 500 people. And uh, 23 members took advantage of an opportunity where we were conservatively, okay, this is back in April, 2016, we quoted 24 point, uh, sorry, 25.6 uh, yearly return on the investment, just to make sure that we were very conservative. It turned out to be this building's built, it's rented out, investors like have tenants, if when we look back at that investment, it gave close to I, I think we worked it out seamless to about forty two point four percent yearly return. Now, if we showed that on the four ways to win, people would think that we're on crack or like, what are you guys doing? This is crazy. Obviously, you're the real estate guys. It doesn't make sense. But so we we conservatively showed twenty five point five percent. It turned out to be forty two point four percent year over year. And so to your point, Simos, it's why we like income properties. Because they generally outperform even our performance. Yeah, yeah. Let's get into that. Stephen has a great question here. I want to get to. Uh, before we do, I want to make one quick comment. Um, Simon, you talked about you know the outcome for buy and hold. The, the exit strategy is to not exit. And I've actually changed the language on how I teach exit strategy. So I don't call it an exit strategy. I call it an outcome strategy. Your outcome is you're going to rent this property forever and pass it on to your kids or or until you're ready. Um, and so I call it an outcome strategy and I want to bring everyone's attention. We have uh, almost 600 people between uh, this Zoom and we're on Facebook Live right now. Um, we just went live on Facebook. I have given all of you a gift. I've given you my free course, Property Profits Blueprint. There's nothing to buy. There's no upsells. It's just my way of supporting you and your personal development. I'm going to put the link here in the description. I want to make sure all of you go create an account. You don't need a credit card or anything. It's just free uh, value that I'm giving you. It's only to the end of April. You have 15 more days. There's already been almost a thousand people that have taken me up on this offer. Um, I have to just like, please go uh, get your get your free content. It's two hours of everything I've learned over the last 20 years. Uh, plus wow. there's about five hours of content. We got bonuses and stuff. So I want to just pause and say, guys, go and get that. I talk about outcome strategy. I talk about uh, finding, it's finding, funding, adding value and outcome on your real estate. So yeah, uh, 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 Denisa says, thank you already complete. You're welcome. You're welcome. Yeah. I want you guys to focus on your personal development if there's nothing else you can do here. So um, of course, it's amazing for focus. Thank you guys. I appreciate the, uh, the That's the very feedback. generous of you, Michael. We'll be yeah. sure to share with our REC insiders. And I yeah, also just want to remind all our audiences, um, meaning um, the REC audiences on Facebook, Instagram, Millionaire by Keyspire, the greatest compliment that anyone can do for anyone, uh, including yourself, is to invite people into a community that you think they will be benefit, other people will benefit from. So if, if I go through my list of friends, I've invited at least a couple hundred people into the Millionaires by Keyspire community. Why? Whether they're Keyspire members or not, they, have, they stand to benefit from the energy of such a high achieving group. Yep. In a time like this, where people are down on their luck, looking for strategies, looking on replacement income and what do I do for this? What do I do for that? This is the time to share resources. So on a link like this, where you can have access to such knowledge free of charge, it would be something for you to tell your neighbors and friends about, for sure. 
Great point. Please share. I, this is free for the world until the end of April. Please share with everyone. Thank you, Simeon. Anyone you, you think this would be great, post it on your Facebook. Like normally I'd say, don't share my stuff for free because we work hard and spend a lot of time and money to produce this. <laughs> right now I'm saying share it all for free till the end of April. I, I put it, you know what guys, I put a, somebody asked me, well, why, why do the end of April? Why don't you make it free forever? I don't make it free forever because nobody will actually finish it. I have to put an end time on it because I'm taking it away at the end of April. So please yeah. finish it. It's, it's going to, it's my way of uh, like ethically forcing you to finish it. That sounds bad. I think ethically. No, I, I think, I, I think it's perfect the way you said it. We, 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 I come across it all the time. You give people unlimited time. They won't take action. You give a yeah. little deadline and now they're, they're, they're that more apt to take action. Yeah. Okay. Questions. Uh, so Steven, I get, we're going to go with you first. He, can't, he got in right after 11 o'clock. Uh, Jazz and, and Simos mentioned to be able to defer payments for pre-construction condos uh, on their on another event. Can you have them expand on this process? So let's get into pre-construction. Okay. So you guys have, you have done over a hundred million, maybe hundreds of millions in uh, managing transactions on pre-construction condo, probably almost a hundred million with just our KeySpark community. Like you guys have- yes. you, pros at this. Um, let's talk about it a little bit. A lot of people here are invested or might want to invest now in pre-construction. Uh, what are some details? We'll start with, uh, how do you defer payments? Uh, so, talk about that. So if you worked with REC um, for your purchase, um, just email us at info at REC canada.com let us know the project and the unit number and our team like even right now is standing by um, to make the call for you to send out the email to the developer um, let us know how long and which payments you want to defer so just look at the first page of your agreement of purchase and sale you'll see the your address you'll see the purchase price right underneath the purchase price is the deposit the down payment structure the amounts and the dates let us know what you want to move them to, like if you need a couple of months for each uh, installment, and we'll request that for the develop, uh, from the developer. We've been up to, I think we're batting approximately, like I think it's a thousand percent. The developers are very understanding of the current situation. Um, they, are, they are doing their best. They're doing whatever they possibly can to extend those uh, dates. If you did not work with REC, we want to make sure we bring you value. Again, look at the first page of your agreement of purchase and sale. Get in touch with the developer uh, or the developer's lawyer. That's who you wrote the check. It was payable to XYZ law, law firm and request uh, an extension. Quick little tip here. Ask and request for more than you need. So if you wanted two months, request three months as an extension in hopes of, it's just a little negotiation uh, strategy where if you ask for three months, they might come back and say two months and you'll kind of finish off what you were hoping for. So it's quite simple. Just, just reach out and ask. And guys, we were talking about taking action. Like do this right away. You worked with us, send us the emails, let us know the project. If you did this on your own, get to it right now, get to the, uh, uh, like after this call, make sure that you reach out to the law office or the builder's office directly and ask for that uh, uh, extension. Awesome. And so Simeon, I've got one for you. Thank you, Jazz. That's great. Um, Simeon, Joshua asks, wouldn't property values only drop significantly if larger number of people sold the homes under market value in any sort of general area? So people are starting to sell, maybe they're selling under value. Um, doesn't that make property values drop? Uh, so so the, the, the answer is it depends. Uh, as I explained earlier, uh, when we saw a 76% dip, because we did see a 75% drop in sales volume uh, after all is said and done. So if the listings kept coming to market and there's a 76% drop in sales and the listings stayed the same at the volume coming on to market, you would have the biggest buyer, buyer's market the world had ever seen. But when the, the sales volume drops 76% and the listing volume drops almost 80%, not only did it... Uh, uphold the integrity of the pricing in our markets. Uh, it, it's actually driving scarcity further. And as um, one of the brokers that's logged on as, as, a, as a participant uh, to this webinar mentioned, uh, everything in Guelph, for example, and I can tell you that that's the case because I just sold three properties. My team sold three of my clients' properties uh, for above asking this week, like yesterday, the day before, and on the weekend. Um, in, into multiples, prices have actually gone up. 
Um, so if we're talking about price integrity and, and how do prices go up and up and down, it's still supply and demand. The market factors are still in line and the same as always um, with uh, the, the, the lower uh, sales volume came lower supply, which has as so far has maintained the integrity of the market. And really and to Joshua's message. question, um, <coughs> yes, if, if, if a lot of people on the same street sold um, uh, at the same time and the homes were comparable and they, and, they, and they had somewhat like of a fire sale, that will determine value because how we as realtors determine values on, on duplexes, multiple, like anything kind of five doors and under is based on the comparison approach. And what that is, is we look at what have comparable homes in a specific time frame sold for. If there's one home that like literally like sold for $100,000 less than everyone else, we kind of chalk that up as an outlier. And that's not, the, we don't really consider that in the comparables. If there's three other homes that, that, that kind of match the layout, match the size, match if, you know, did it have an income property or not? What was the curb, like, what was the landscaping? Like, how was it, were the kitchens updated? Were the bathrooms updated? So we definitely look at comparables and we don't only just take one home. We want to look at three to four different homes. It's how we come also, it's how you should be looking at, uh, play, uh, uh, marketing your places for rent. You need to look at not only one place, just don't compare it to one unit or one home. Look at what the general area within a one, two kilometer radius last 30 days, 60 days. And if nothing comes up, then you need to stretch the parameters uh, geographically as well as time. And that's how value is determined. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, Lillian has a great question. A lot of people are probably in this situation or maybe. We're closing in July, she says, uh, but the appraisal value is dropping. What should I do? Can I negotiate further after removing subject? Um, I, Maybe so Simeon is a great one for you. You do Go thousands on. of these transactions a month. Go, buddy. Yeah. Uh, so, so this is a matter of timing. And Lillian just may be caught uh, in a crappy time in the middle of a deal. And this is why A, real estate is an essential service. And this is why uh, real professional uh, support is going to be required for her to get through the finish line. Um, first of all, uh, Lillian, uh, if, if you if you would like, uh, I would be happy to do a, a personal deal review. I don't care where you bought and who you bought with. I'd be happy to consult with you and take a look at the terms that you negotiated uh, to see if there is an out uh, and to see if there's any way with the parties involved. Depending on who has to gain what, it may be beneficial uh, to the to the seller to work with you, meaning that if you only put down five, 10, 20 grand uh, as a down payment and the appraisal came came uh, came back 100K under what you thought it would be worth, walking away from 10K or 15K could be the, the smartest thing you've ever done. Now, if you have 150K down and the, and the value came down 20,000, who really gives a shit? Let's be honest here. So it just depends on the circumstances. It's a hard question to guide you through because it's an important one. You're in the middle of a deal. Um, and July is far away. A lot of things can happen between now and July. So I would be very, very happy to take a look personally at your, at your deal uh, and consult with you uh, and give you some strategic uh, points if you so need. And, 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 and we've seen situations like this in the past before as well. If you look back to 2017, um, in the earlier part of the year, values were skyrocketing by 18% a year. Then the fair housing plan came in exactly April 8th or something of 2017. But people years had closing to the day, eh, buddy? Two, two years to the date. Um, uh, 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 buyers had and investors had purchased uh, properties that were closing after that April 8th, April 12th date uh, back in 2017. But then values drop slightly because of the fair housing plan where appraisals were coming in lower. Now, the strategy, and, and please get that deal over to Seamus, because one thing he's going to be able to do is look at comparables again. Because sometimes appraisers, it's, they're literally just looking at it online. They punch in 123 Main Street. It shoots them out. It shoots them out a report. But we can, and Seamus will, do a lot more digging to see if we can prove that there's other properties that are very comparable that the appraiser might have missed that we can send as proof of, of, of the uh, 
of the purchase price that you purchased at. So we might be able to show some more proof is really what the appraisal and the lender, the lender is looking for, hey, tell me that this is worth $800,000 because our appraiser is saying it's worth 750. But when CMOS looks at it, he's going to say, look, there's three other properties that sold for 795, 810, um, and, and, and 785. Here's the average. You should be able to, Mr. Appraiser, um, appraise this at around eight, uh, closer to 800,000. Yeah, in challenging an appraisal is common in our business. People always all, think, oh, no, you can't do yeah. that. You can't tell an yeah. appraiser. Yes, you can. For sure. We got to prove it. You should. And exactly. Mm-hmm. Yep. yep. And so how does someone get a hold of your team? Is it info at rec.com? Yep, yep. Is that the best way if somebody wants to get a hold of you? It's info at rec.canada.com. So just make sure there's two C's in the middle there, recanada.com. Our air traffic control guy, Tyler Walburn, a lot of you know him. He brings it all in and then he'll put it to the right person. Excellent. And Kelly has put that in our uh, chat here. So you can all see how to get a hold of the REC Canada team. And um, they also have a great podcast, the REC Experience. So just search that, check it out. You'll see Jazz uh, and Jazz and Simeon and Laura and all their great guests um, on there often. And great content. So I, I recommend you Thank follow you. that uh, and share it as well. You know, share it's free resources. We, we do this stuff for free because we love adding value to you guys. And um, we hope that we can add value. And then you guys, I don't know, but you add value and you guys become a customer one day, which is great. And if you do, I would love to be able to train you in other real estate. The guys would love to be able to take care of you with your transactions. And if you don't, we've added free value, amazing value, we hope for you. So that's, that's how we do it. That's what we love to do. Um, we, if you want to be up to date with the Keyspire stuff, make sure that you join the Keyspire community. Uh, I'm going to put the link in here. This is our digital series, our weekly email. It's how we communicate things like Coffee with Michael and the other really cool programs that we're doing and we are going to be doing in the next few years. So make sure you did, sign up. Uh, sorry, Michael. I did see a lot of um, uh, comments about asking, um, and I'm not sure if you're seeing it on your end there as well, just about what opportunity somebody might want to somebody could take advantage of or look at. Um, yeah. I, I wouldn't mind. And like, we, we can go through some, some possible opportunities that are available, but I wanted to throw something at you really quickly, Michael, if you were an investor, what would you be looking at? If I was a, if I was looking to grow my portfolio right now, yeah. I would be looking for situations where somebody has a problem and I can solve it. So I think, you know, I'll start big picture. All business is, is finding a solution to somebody's problem. And I heard somebody say like over 10 years ago, maybe like a John Maxwell kind of, kind of insightful person. Love that guy. Um, Yeah. If you can solve people's problems, you will be a multimillionaire in business with a great reputation your entire life. So that's where I would start. I'd say, okay, well, what problems do people have? And then I would say, what am I good at? If I don't know how to do renovations or flips or any of that, then that's probably not, I can't offer that solution if that's what somebody needs. So I'd say, what am I good at? What problems do people have and how can I solve them? So for me, I'm really good at renting properties. I've got some very specific and strategic marketing systems. I'm very good at taking care of my customer and my tenant ahead of time during the transaction and afterwards. So I would probably help people that are, have vacant properties for multiple months. Either I could partner with them or I would buy the property from them. And I would, um, I would, I would do something seemingly magical, but it's just a clever marketing, a a smart marketing system. Um, and it's funny because, uh, it's not a property that's bad. It's the management 99% of the time, right? I've seen, I've seen a property and someone's like, ah, it's such a shitty property. It doesn't do well. You just put a new manager in there or a new owner or a new, you know, somebody that's taking care of it differently. And now the property does half uh, 300 bucks a month in cash flow and 45% return. So that's what I would do. It's a great question. Thank you, Jazz. Is I would find out what I'm good at. I would identify and write on a piece of paper what I'm good at and then find the people where I can solve their problem based on my expertise. And with this case, it would be management. It would be renovations. I would, I would look to help people that are halfway through a renovation and might run out of money or motivation or, you know, they're in a bad situation because some shit is happening in their life. And I can come in, I can probably partner with them. I don't want to put any money down. I would partner with them. I would sprinkle in my expertise and my management. And then we would split the profits 50, 50 on whatever our outcome strategy is. So that's, that's how I would answer that in a couple minutes or less. Yeah. So I I did want to mention jazz. Um, I'm putting together kind of a a spearhead group, uh, one kind of for commercial real estate, one for pre-construction as well. And I know we want to talk a little bit of pre-construction. I don't know what kind of timing you have. If you have some time, uh, there are some big points I'd want to touch on for the community. 
Uh, Let's do it. Yeah. Can you guys stay? We're, we're at 12. We, we haven't had many people drop off. We're still over 500 between our channels. Um, do you, can you guys spend five or 10 more minutes? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. All right, Simeon, go ahead. Yeah, let's hear it. What I want to do is the, the number one question is uh, that people are asking, and, and this is a lot of buyers, like uh, investor buyers, well, this is what they do, uh, is why are we not seeing any launches? Why are we not seeing any new product come to market? What does this mean? So first and foremost, going back to the fundamentals, nothing has changed from the city of Toronto being host to the biggest in most universities, biggest in most hospitals, biggest in most insurance companies, we are the service sector of the country. Uh, the uh, Ontario as a whole, uh, the economics of Ontario are still the strongest they ever were. Having a temporary pause because of a pandemic is just that. So to answer the question, why are there no launches? No builder is gonna go to market and sell at a dollar here today if they don't know if their supply chain for their material, their construction, a cruise has been compromised or not. Meaning. If they were to sell you uh, at, at call it five hundred thousand dollars for a two bedroom unit, they sold you that today, but they can't start construction for another year, which is a year behind schedule now. The cost to build this unit has gone up as a result of high demand for the same crews because of time, because of price changes in the market, which will make them cancel the project altogether. Which means you put your deposits down, and instead of making money. A year or two years later, you just get your money back uh, from the trust. You don't lose your money. That's also a top question. We'll get to that. But you just get your money back and you don't have any um, any return on that money. So the job of myself, my partner, and my team, uh, my your job when you do the due diligence for every project that, that we bring to the table is who is the builder? How well funded are they? How far along are they? And this pandemic just makes the test even more rigid. So as now, um, like earlier today, I sent Jazz an email. I got the first email of somebody thinking of launching. And it's online. And it's it's Altry. Like, I I don't need to mince my words. They sent an email out. So it's top secret. So Altry Developments is is a massive company. Well, they're backed by they're, they're backed by Lantera. Lantera pretty much right. built everything in terms of downtown right. Toronto um, from a commercial perspective, Air Canada Center, all that. They're backed by a very well funded family. So great point, Simos. Um, in terms of so, what we're so they're seeing, coming. yeah, they're, they're, they're going to start coming. And to Michael's point, when you can find an opportunity or a couple of opportunities where you know that the the seller um, or the builder um, is is offering more incentives than so, they so have in the has, past. So this is what I wanted to get into. So yeah. th- there are builders. So like the, the new ones halted the majority. So call it eighty percent are not launching. Yeah, the, but the builders who launched in the last six months. Yep. Where we sold twenty units, thirty units, fifteen units here, they got stuck in a cycle right now. Yep. And there is opportunity there. So if this group. And I'm not saying like a lot of people are on the sidelines, a lot of people, but if you're one of those people who are growing through this pandemic and it's your prerogative to do so, there are opportunities in the GTA where there's guaranteed rental opportunities, uh, cash flow positive opportunities. I'm not talking about that we don't have 2030 to do an email campaign, but if there's a few people that are opportunists that have the capital available, you go into contract, you can get some steals right now. Some steals. Well, to to talk directly to that, if it's okay with you, Michael, I can I can go through kind of the two opportunities that um, we were able to package for our investors going back to the builders. And Seamus and I got on calls with all the builders where the the project was it's either complete in, in one situation and the second project is about eighty percent complete. It's slated to be uh, uh, finished um, uh, in like late March, early April of twenty twenty one. But they're still allowed construction because they're they're far enough in the process, so construction's not halted. One's right in downtown Toronto um, with a three year rental guarantee um, uh, and no condo fees for two years years where you'll see approximately cash flow for those first couple of years within the three-year rental guarantee of about $600 a month. 
And that's right in the downtown core. Uh, it's for one bedroom and two bedroom units. Your down payment of 20% is also deferred. So you could put 5% down now, lock it up, tie yourself up with the builder to get a written three-year rental guarantee. Okay. And you don't have to put the remainder of the, uh, of the 20% down until um, March of 2021. The second project is um, the second project is a student housing project in Oshawa, um, where there's also a one-year rental guarantee as well in place. So you're protected, and you know that it's going to be tenanted as well. Um, and and that is actually closing. It's already built, uh, but you can close in September just to kind of get past the hard storm of, of the pandemic, so to speak, from a financing perspective. Um, so there's still opportunities to take advantage of um, if, as Michael mentioned, you're on that, you're, you're in the, 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 the mindset, the state of mindset that you are growing your portfolio. And so to get information on any of those opportunities, same email, just make a note that you, uh, the boys mentioned uh, an opportunity on uh, with Michael. It's info at recanada.com. Well, what do you guys think about doing? It sounds like there's a lot of information. I know these um, specific deals, uh, they go quick, but there's a lot of information. What if we shot out like a quick video over the next week to everybody just kind of going, if you went through the numbers and stuff, that way we don't, um, I, I don't want to keep people too long because I want you guys to be able to get some lunch and we have, uh, some other, what, yeah, what do you guys think if we, if you guys did another video, I don't we even do love it. On it. Okay, perfect. We would love that, Michael. In a perfect world, we could have uh, something new as well. Uh, but these uh, these opportunistic buys, uh, I would send because there's just not that much of that inventory that's caught in the mix. Uh, I would simply, really and truly, if you have any interest at all, just look at it quickly and try to tie it up. Send an email to info at REC Canada for these opportunistic ones. Uh, but we can definitely shoot a video because if we can unearth uh, some more of these developers that are caught in the fringe mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. are just a few sales away from hitting their uh, their benchmarks, uh, we'll be golden. So de definitely. Yeah. If there's yeah. if there's anything that we're good at, other than being good looking, it's reverse engineering what people are looking for. So <laughs> if the group here tells us, hey, this is what we're looking for, the five, six units that are available right now, those go, will go out and just get more. It's it's kind of our specialty. So uh, to answer your question, yes, obviously, Michael, we'll do whatever brings awesome. value to your community, my man. Awesome. And you guys have the relationships. I mean, I could never find these deals because I don't have the network of relationships built that Jazz and Simeon have built over the tens of years, like their entire career. So the relationship is the most important part. And that's why you're going to see things from them that you, you're not going to see from a lot of people. So why don't we, you know, I'm going to ask the audience, if you guys are interested in seeing some more information that we don't have time to cover now, maybe 10 minute, five or 10 minute video, uh, right? Hell yeah. Or yes in there. I want to see. These <laughs> yes. Yes. If people it. like it, then we'll, we'll do it. Right. So, <laughs> um, all right. I want to ask you guys, when we close here, I just want to ask you guys what your strategy would be. First, I want to, Oh, we have more than 10. We Holy have, crap. You have like, you're getting up to a hundred buddy. <laughs> my, yeah. My computer's smoking now. This is awesome. Okay. guys. Thank so you. we're making a video <laughs> Thank and you, really, guys. really quickly. Um, you know, you said you talked about us having the up uh, uh, the relationships and everything, and we do what we're good at. Michael, I've always said about you, man. I think like I have yet to come across anyone. I've yet to come across anyone that can build a community um, as big as you can and as quick as you can. So, like, a huge kudos, man! Like, just a huge kudos to you. How fast you build communities, um, and they're long lasting. So, thank you for doing all that. Thank you. You're welcome. And thank you guys for being part of it for so Your many years. In a cameo, Jazz. I just saw them. Yeah, Sorry, yeah the that? kids. I just saw the kids. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> made it. <laughs> Thank you everyone for being a part of it. Everyone that's watching here. Some of you have been following me for five or 10 years. Some of you, this might be the first time you've seen me or Jazz or Simeon. So uh, thank you truly for all you guys being here. It makes what we do worth it. You're adding value to me and adding value to us by, by paying attention to our message. And I hope we have a, a message that's helpful for you. All right. So in closing, uh, what would you guys do if you were starting out right now and you said, I have to continue investing forward? Pausing is not an option for me, Michael, guys. I can't just sit at home and pause. Uh, what would what would your strategy be? What would you advise somebody if there was your, I always look at if your brother or sister or cousin came up to you and like, I really need help. What do I do next? Uh, what would you say to that, that family member? Go ahead, Simos. You take the first one. Uh, yeah, no problem. Uh, if I'm speaking to a buyer, 
Uh, I would tell them that this is a tremendous uh, opportune uh, and great time to be looking at real estate, uh, even if it's through a virtual camera. Um, and, uh, and, and my advice would be to immediately uh, set yourself up with a bank. Uh, take a look at what your strengths are, what your limits are, uh, and make some really strong decisions. So if you do see an opportunity, you can uh, strike immediately. Uh, my question, uh, my, my discussion with the seller, uh, and this is COVID or no COVID, um, I'm not a seller of real estate. I'm a buyer of real estate. So before, and I say this to every single listing appointment I've ever had, unless you need to sell, what am I doing here? Mm -hmm. so if you need to sell, I get their motivation. Uh, and if it is valid enough, I would list the home. But my advice would be to stay the course, relax, make sure you're getting value from the marketplace and understanding, reading the appropriate headlines, not uh, looking at uh, willy-nilly uh, headlines that are just there for clickbait. I'll be looking at the real stories and real outcomes uh, and uh, building my network. I would use this time to build my network. Love it. Build the relationships, build your network. Yeah. Jazz. You know, Sven, uh, high level, I'll kind of go um, into the micro uh, tack from a tactical perspective. If you're going to put something into contract, me specifically, if I'm speaking to my brother, who's an, an avid investor, um, he owns a little over uh, 10, 11 doors right now, and he's actively looking. So your point about speaking to your brother, it's quite easy because I just had a conversation with him yesterday. And so the tactical advice would be is, Put, like negotiate a deal now, okay? Because it's a great time to look at uh, opportunities. But have a closing date approximately 90 to 120 days out if you can. And if you can even go out further, that much better. And the reason being is because when we're going to be renting out to tenants, we're going to be past this storm. That's just my my personal opinion. And, and so you're going to be able to um, not worry if the tenant's going to pay or not, right? And so... You'll, you'll be able to look at the tenant's profile with a lot more clarity. So set your closing date uh, a little further out than 90 days. And if you can get a rental guarantee, and I know we spoke about it, guys, a rental guarantee in the last 15 years that I've been doing this, I get rental guarantees about, um, I'm going to say I probably only got about 10 in my career. So less than once a year, you're protecting yourself. It's in writing that someone's going to pay the rent every single month. We laugh and say, I hope they don't even rent it out because then my units don't get touched. But <laughs> we, know that they're putting, we know that they're putting their money where their mouth is, and so you're protected. So it would be kind of a combination. Try to get a rental guarantee, um, and then uh, if you can't, get the closing a little further out. And we've never seen – I know you had Callum Ross on not too long ago. I just did a podcast with him as well. I mean, money's never been as cheap, and so you don't need to be – like extra, like you don't have to be that smart to understand that money's never been as cheap it is as it is right now. And so you might even want to consider locking in your rates a little bit longer as well. Amazing. I have a Great question tips. for you, Michael. Yeah. Can, I, can, I, can I turn it around on you for a second, my man? Yes. Uh, you, you, you gave us your real estate tip and we spoke real estate as well. But you, your company, your company um, is one of the fastest growing companies in the country. Um, you have tons of staff, you have tons of employees, you've been in business for a very long time, very successful business at that. What's your tip for some business owners right now going through this time from a mindset perspective? Because I, I personally, you, we look at you as someone that we speak to on a regular basis. We look at you uh, as somewhat of a mentor of ours. Um, and so what is that tip for business owners uh, from Michael Saracini. Yeah. So the way I would look at it is um, <clears throat> the offensive and defensive game. So I meet with my team uh, with Keyspire every single Monday and, and you guys are watching as well. And we talk about our defensive game and offensive game during this time, during this crisis planning. Um, so number one, we were set up for this for the most part with our technology. I actually did a great interview with, uh, with Lynn around pandemic planning. So we had our technology in place. We had emergency contact. We had all of the things in place, virtual office set up that, uh, that set us up for success so we could hit the ground running. So then we go with the, we start with the defensive game. Okay, let's, well, we got to play defense for a minute. Defense in business is cash management. Cash flow management is the main defense, 
defensive piece. It's the great time in business to cut out all the shit that you didn't need before. Uh, why do I have three drop boxes? Why do I pay for this service and I don't need it? Do I need the upgraded version of that or I'm okay with the regular version? So it's a good check-in and we managed to save so many expenses just by looking at them, which is which is beautiful. So defensive game is cash management in a crisis time like this, and specifically during this pandemic. So you play defense. Okay, let's get stable. That might take a day. It might take a week or two weeks, depending on the size of your organization. We're, we're a, a medium sized business over 50 people. So, so we got a few things going on after the defensive game is the offensive game. Okay. How do we get in there in the market? So those of you that are in business, how do you get back in the market and how do you have one number one, do you have a relevant product in a everyone stays at home world? So, you know, Zoom, for example, um, I've seen conspiracy theories that Zoom created coronavirus because they went from 10 million to 200 million people overnight. I, maybe that's a crass joke, so I'll move on. But, um, uh, <laughs> but some businesses are like, holy shit, this is perfect for my business. Uh, and some businesses are like, what are we going to do? So, for example, Keyspire, we do live events. We had to cancel all of our live events, postpone them from March, April, May. A lot of you are, are, are watching that have, have been a part of or purchased those live events, and we're going to do them again. But part of our strategy is how do we continue to deliver value? And anybody watching with a business, think of it this way, restaurant owners, small businesses, bulk barn, I don't know, it doesn't matter. How do I continue to deliver value with these new set of rules? Because the rules always change in business. So that's what you have to look to do. That's what we're looking at at Keyspire. In my fitness company, we're looking, so I have a fitness company and we primarily sell gym-based workouts. Um, our core workout is called MP45 workout. And um, I'm not selling any workouts because all the gyms are closed. So my trainers are rapidly developing products where people can work out at home. People can do their healthy things from home. So my business continue, I can pay the expenses and not only survive, but thrive. But I can do the most important thing, which is solve a problem people have. In the fitness business, people have a problem. They're home and they can't, they don't know what to do at home because they've never been stuck at home for months. How do I work out at home? So we're solving that problem for them. And so it's the same thing, same thing with any business is uh, start with the defense, manage your cash, manage your cash flow, look out to uh, the cash flow projections, and then go on offense. How do I deliver value to the world playing by the new rules? Those would be Love the best. Love it. Thank you for that, my man. Thank you. Yeah, you got it. And of course, guys, try on the jeans. <laughs> try on the jeans. I haven't, I haven't done this yet. Like, I got to admit, I got to follow my own advice. Anyone who's joining me tomorrow, there's still, all of you guys are almost still on here. I want to know tomorrow if you tried the jeans on. I'm going to try these on later today and see, see, hopefully I'm okay here. Jazz, Simon, thank you guys for taking an hour and a half out of your day. Totally appreciate it. Thank you for being here. Thank you to everyone who listened to us. We appreciate you. And uh, Michael, we appreciate you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. You got it. We'll talk soon. Have a great day, guys. We'll talk soon. Have a great day, everyone. Bye, everyone. This has been the REC Experience Podcast with Jazz Takar, an REC Canada production. Hey guys, thanks so much for watching and listening. Please, please take a second right now to subscribe and follow us on whatever podcast platform you're watching or listening. It means the world to me. Thank you. <laughs>